All right, guys. <sighs> Banding versus broadcasting. I love nutrient management, but we're going to have to kind of keep this short and simple. So we're not going to go down the whole strip till, no till kind of thing. We're just going to kind of stick to the fertilizer itself. Disclaimer one, fertility is extremely local. You need to do your research on your farm to find the best cash flow, excuse me, that you can for your crops. Two, I need to stop yawning for number two. Um, the definition of banding, if we're gonna follow university uh, guidelines for banding versus broadcasting, we should be on the same page. Banding is bringing your nutrient to a concentrated zone somewhere in the in the root zone. Um, that That's the definition of banding. When you see YouTube people and, and other people talk about how they ban fertilizer with an air cart that's blowing across the width of the, the field cultivator, that's not banding. Give them a participation trophy because that's what they expect and uh, they're entitled to that and, and pat them on the back and, and shoo them along so the adults can keep talking. Uh, anybody that, that thinks that they're banding just because they're incorporating, I, 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 would, I would just let them stick to making combining corn videos and, and anything they have to say about nutrient management is uh, just, just noise, just simple noise. Um, we need to understand your, your local agronomy team needs to understand that there is a huge difference between banding and fertilizer as far as what you buy from them. If your local agronomy team says, you know, we don't believe that there's much difference between banding and broadcasting. One, where's your data to back that up? Two, why does most major universities say like the opposite of that? And three, goodbye. Um, that's money, guys. This is our money column. I don't need people like that trying to take my money or help me spend my money on bad decisions. That's where we need to do a lot of on-farm testing. Egg PhD gets it right when they say you need to do trials on our farm. We tried it on our farm. We hope you try it on your farm. That is the one thing they say that is right. You need to do trials on your farm. CEC. So we hear CEC is a factor of 10. No, it is not. Uh, in talking to several soil biologists and chemists at a couple different of the universities, I have Minnesota and North Dakota that I can send emails to and talk to people to try to find and research this kind of stuff. Um, most of them never heard of that formula, wondered where that came from. When you tell them where I first heard it, they chuckle and they're just like, oh, okay. <laughs> that might be true for that farm scenario. The data is not wrong. You just can't say that that's right or now an industry standard because that is not an industry standard. It means zero to anything. Um, your CEC is the ability of your soil to hold nutrients. But you have to do some own, that's where you need to do your own testing again, is uh, environment, soil type, tillage practices, soil health, you know, everything is an influence on how that CEC is going to work for you. So take that with a grain of salt. Again, do the testing on your farm. Um, the, the K. K is very dependent upon the type of clay. If your local agronomist says, hey, I get that you guys are, are under strain this year, so go ahead and just pull back on P and K. I would not fire him. I would applaud him for the effort of recognizing that we need to save money, but I would send him to Google and you need to Google um, clay type versus potassium response or potassium response to different types of clay in the soil. Um, so the, the, the farmer to farmer, um, potassium to clay for dummies. Cliff notes is my takeaway was that Western Minnesota has very different clay than Southeastern Minnesota. On paper, their soil tests could look extremely similar. But if a guy had a very low reading in central Minnesota on his K, he could apply 20% and see a very good return on investment. At 20% of a recommended rate, he could see a great crop and um, save a lot of money. The, the other guy, he might have to apply 
120 or 150 percent of recommended rate to find that return on investment or if he stayed at a very reduced rate he might see it in yield um and so that that's going to hurt your cash flow worse than trying to save a few dollars per acre so again you need to do some of these nutrients on their own in some check strips around your farm to find where that cash flow is. So behind me, what we have here is kind of just a basic corn program when we were doing full tillage and broadcast fertilizer. We had roughly 200 pounds of 92330. We had bought in about 130 nitrogen credits of N itself. Shooting for, we always shot for 160 some bushel corn. Granted in full tillage, we hardly, I don't, we never got it across the farm. Um, the ground was just way too variable to, to come out with huge yields like that. Sulfur and nitrogen are both extremely mobile in the soil. Confidence going into 19 to start doing some reduced nitrogen trials is because of our sulfur. So when we were doing full tillage, that's 100 pounds of AMS. That's not 100 sulfur credits. The others are applied credits, purchased credits, and the cost. Um, when we did 100 pounds pre-plant of AMS, we would see corn striping late in season. That's not good. When we did 100 pounds of AMS at top dress, we would see sulfur striping at that knee-high corn. What we ended up doing was going 50, 60 pounds ahead of planter, 50, 60, 70 pounds at V6, V5 when we were top dressing, and that cured our sulfur issues. Now, when we moved to banding, that was why we got into strip till. At that point, several years ago, soil health wasn't a concern. We had started no-tilling to try to see if we couldn't stop erosion and, and also save equipment, wear and tear cost, hours, all that crap, and grow the same crop. Strip-till came about because um, we needed to save money. Following the co-op's recommended guidelines, it seemed every year to grow the same crop, it seemed we needed a little more and more fertilizer. And I, I found that to be quite interesting um how that whole program just kind of keeps spiraling down and down and before you know it um you're you're buying more fungicides and you're buying more insects you know insecticides and it, it just it wasn't working so uh to control our macro expenses on the micro level we went to strip till and uh that the strip till itself saved us all the mechanical money of horsepower, labor, and equipment costs. But the big thing was, right off the top, 50% applied P and K. That is, these are the dollars, you know, cut in half. So right off the top, we saved about 30 bucks. Right off the top. The interesting part was our sulfur. Remember how sulfur is extremely mobile through the soil. When we were broadcast and incorporating it, we lost out sulfur very fast. In strip, half, we did we did about 60, 60, maybe even close to 65 pounds. Uh, we might have done some at 70, but we never did any at 100. Um, for the most part, it was half. And uh, we saw no striping in season, even late season. So that was a huge indicator. So then after a couple years of that, then we now have confidence to move to our nitrogen next. Now our nitrogen this year, we're going to be doing a lot of testing. We've got the one three acre field. We're going to have a, a couple dozen or a dozen tests in there about applied nitrogen after cover crops uh, with cover crops and after cover crops with no cover crops at, at different 25, 50, 75 and hundred percent applied rates to see how the, the applied rates affect the growing crop and cover crop versus no cover crop in season. Does that affect anything? And then we'll also do the same nitrogen tests on some check soil um, to see, well, on the cover crop ground, our 75% our, uh, was our return on investment, but on the non-cover crop ground, 100% was the return on investment. Or, or, you know, maybe it stayed at 70% as well, showing the efficiency of banding. Um, but yeah, so we got, we got the confidence 
to start moving into now uh, attacking our nitrogen dollars. Uh, granted, as we move into that, a lot of our corn ground now is also getting turkey litter, which changes everything again. Um, but yeah, so the, the dollars itself, if we can apply in, in a full tillage program, we can still run through our sprayer. K is the only one that we can't band in a liquid form. Um, but if we can get our NP and sulfur with our micro pack, if, if there's anybody that applies a micro pack, micros, believe it or not, guys, we don't do much micros here. Um, several years ago, talking to some of the local agronomy team and the co-ops as to how much micro packs they are selling, pretty much zero. Uh, our environment is the biggest limiter to our yield. Uh, when we have environment, we get fantastic yields. When we don't have environment, we don't get yields. Very rarely have we ever gone into the fall thinking, man, sure wish I had more manganese on that or molly bedam. I wish we had more molybdenum on that. Oh boy, look at that. You know, we I don't ever remember anybody ever saying that here locally. Um, but micros in the future might be something to test. <clears throat> Just a little kind of off off topic side note there, but we are talking fertility. Um, so we did that. The other thing then that we're taking advantage of by moving forward with our nitrogen is buying, we're gonna be buying less nitrogen, but we're gonna be treating it. So last year, 2018, we spent the money on treatments. We saw how phenomenal spending the, the money per acre on treating that nitrogen was. So now that also is gonna help us move forward with a reduced amount. Um, so yeah, 30 bucks right off the top. How can we do that here? We've got our sprayers, we've got our side dress rigs, um, whatever, excuse me, whatever your imagination can come up with on how to band and stay in here. If you're running that field cultivator, uh, anhydrous, you know, guys have been ban banding anhydrous for decades. Uh, it works very well. <sighs> the natural fitment. So here's, here's kind of where the video ends and, and I, I will ask so for the farmers that are staying over here what are you going to do when fertilizer prices keep going up another 10 20 30 percent over the next couple of years what are you going to do when the fuel and the horsepower and the cost of replacing uh tractors and implements and wear parts and all that stuff goes up 10 20 30 40 percent in the next couple of years your labor and time um what are you going to do when you're uh, broadcasting and, and shallow incorporating when regulations come down and say, well, you can no longer apply at this time. This is now your window of opportunity to apply and, and stuff like that. How's that going to affect your farm? For the guys over here that are using soil health practices of strip till uh, or no-till and banding with coulters, um, I am not a no-till Nazi. I do not believe you have to be zero till to be in the no-till department. If you are a no-tiller, but you are using coulter carts to apply your um, nutrient program, hey, I, I will buy you a no-till hat if somebody says that you're not a true no-tiller. Um, I can say that because as of right now, there's only a few hundred views. When I get 100,000 views, I might be eating them words because I won't be able to afford to buy all the hats. Um, you, you see some of these zero tillers that are like, you know, if we could get rid of the, the planter discs and somehow just magically punch that seed in the ground, that's where we'd be. That That's not practical for most guys, uh, especially row crop guys. We're just, you know, there's a big difference between a guy running cattle and a guy growing row crops on their whole nutrient management program. So no-tillers, do not be scared to get some type of coulter to get that stuff in the ground if that's what you need for your farm. Um... But when we get down this whole soil side, you know, now we're talking regulations aren't really going to bother us because we're ahead of regulations. Some of these timing regulations, we might still be compliant because of how we're doing it and uh, stuff like that. So I'm not terribly worried. I do not like regulations. I think it's a complete pile of crap. But at the same time, we need regulations. Uh, so there's that, that fine line. Um, but yeah, so, so that's my questions over here. And the other question is... Um, what are you going to do to make your crop more efficient? How come um, we keep needing more and more to produce similar? Um, I, I, you know, so I, I have a lot of questions about broadcast fertility programs. Um, how come we have swath control 
on our sprayers. Every farmer is just adamant that we have swath control on our sprayer to control a $20 per acre investment so that we limit overlaps. But when it comes to our 50, uh, and that's the, that's the low end. Uh, if you went to a liquid, you could almost double that. Um, you know, um, let's say you're at 100 bucks an acre of nitrogen or even at 50. That's twice the dollars per acre that your chemical program is running. Why would we not want to swath control uh, that? If we're doing all these in one application, that's three and four and, and six times, eight times the cost of your fertilizer. Why are we not trying to swath control $200 an acre versus $20 an acre? Um, so there's my questions on that. Um, yeah, so I think we'll just end it right there. Guys, thanks for watching. Um, I've got my questions. What are your thoughts? What's working for you? What's not working for you? Uh, where do you hope to go? And, and leave your comments below. And uh, thank you for watching.